Hello, dear ones. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Mindful Compassion Hour, our Compassionate Relationship with Suffering series, a six-session offering through the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation in partnership with Engaging Mindfulness, Forging Meaning. The mission of the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation is to establish optimal quality of life for the Northwest Parkinson's community through awareness, education, advocacy, and care. My name is Barcha Wachtel, and I'm a Master's of Social Work, licensed independent clinical social worker, mental health professional, and trained teacher in mindful self-compassion through the Center for MSC at the University of California, San Diego's Medical Center. My private practice is Engaging Mindfulness, Forging Meaning, or EMFM for short. And you can always find out more about my practice and programs at www.emfm.space. The mission of EMFM is to engage people of diverse identities and abilities in cultivating wise attention, deep meaning, and fiercely compassionate ways of being as the foundations for transformation, interconnection, and well being. Mindful Compassion Hour, the Compassionate Relationship with Suffering series, is a series of six sessions that are meant to provide educational support for people living with chronic conditions as well as their caregivers in the basic practices of compassion toward themselves and as well as towards others. These practices are based in psychological neuroscience and what is called the Buddhist psychology and you're learning how to respond to difficult situations in life, and painful situations in life with understanding and kindness. These practices are correlated with physical and emotional well-being outcomes that are beneficial in making sure that our minds and our bodies are supporting us in the best ways possible. You can find out more about Mindful Compassion Hour through the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation website at www.nwpf.org, where previous recordings are always archived and they're free and always available to you as needed. EMFM provides support and education for those impacted by ongoing mental and physical health challenges in personal, social, and professional life through professionally facilitated educational seminars. Although the information and support provided can be psychoeducational in nature, these seminars are, are not counseling, nor are they therapy groups. And EMFM is not providing healthcare services. You should not use the information contained herein for diagnosing or treating any mental or physical health condition. Participation in EMFM Northwest Parkinson's Foundation seminars do not create a mental health provider-patient relationship. We recommend that you always consult with a medical and or mental health professional for medical or mental health care advice or information about diagnosis and treatment. By viewing and engaging this seminar, you acknowledge and agree that if you feel uncomfortable in any way, you have the right and responsibility to take good care of yourself by disengaging from the seminar as a whole or any practice at any time. So this slide is just a disclosure of organizations that I have professional relationships in some capacity. And that's just to be upfront to make sure that you know I'm not trying to sell you anything. The resources and information that I'm giving to you are free and accessible. Um, through the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation, and I also make um, quite a few recordings and practice kind of things available through my own website, as well as some other websites. So a lot of what we're doing here really is looking at, you've heard me use the word Buddhist psychology, and we kind of address the reason why I use that language in the first session. So the Buddhist psychology, essentially the modern version of that is when science has taken um, the research and they're just looking at what happens to human beings 
when we're in states of mindfulness versus states of being mindless, of not paying attention to what's happening in the moment. John Kabat-Zinn does a really nice job in defining contemplative neuroscience, which is the investigation of brain function, consciousness, and mind-body connection in physical and emotional health of persons with mindfulness traits, what we call present moment awareness meditators versus non-meditators. And we already talked last session about um, some of the basic outcomes in the research that they're always looking at it has to do with neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and the outcomes around chronic um, conditions and um, other chronic conditions that go on in people's lives, as well as our longevity and sense of well-being through those telomeres, those ends of our chromosomes that tend to shorten over time. So what are we here for? Well, hopefully those outcomes that we were just talking about is making sure that we're supporting ourselves and our loved ones in the best way that we can. The main thing that we're doing here is really to get in a little bit of practice, the cultivation of awareness, our sense of awareness of what our mind is doing, what our body is doing, the well-being and sense of connection to ourselves and to others. So we're learning how to cultivate that kind of awareness in knowing what we're doing while we're doing it. The other thing is we're engaging in our core values. So it's centered in living in your core values, not mine. Um, but these tend to be more general um, values around um, love and kindness, gentleness, peace, um, having a sense of humor and enthusiasm for life. So unless you have challenges with that, there's really nothing that you have to re reject or accept. So everyone gets to keep their spirituality and their religion, and I'm not trying to proselytize into other, any other kind of faith tradition. We're just looking at the bare science of the Buddhist psychology, as well as the neuroscience of what happens when people meditate. We're also looking at beginner's minds. So part of what practice allows us to do is to, when we feel that we made a mistake or that our mind has wandered or that we failed in some way, um, that we get to be a beginner, just like a little kid getting on a bike for the first time. We're gonna start with maybe a tricycle or training wheels or something else that might be supportive to us or having someone there to guide us on our way. So we can really let go of being the expert. And when we make a mistake, we just go back to the beginning and try to find our balance within the practice again. So you get to have that kind of grace of being able to get back to the beginning and just see what happens over time. So um, it's also about balanced awareness in this moment, not the next moment or the past. And so we're really learning how to be with whatever shows up in the moment. So some people may have the expectation that they're supposed to see bright lights or feel relaxed or have a sense of peace or that their mind will suddenly sit still or that your body will sit still. And I want to make it really clear that you can let go of those expectations. That's not what we're trying to do. So it's not about trying to make something happen. It's learning, kind of like the title of this, um, this course talks about, is learning how to be with, in relationship to anything and everything that shows up in the moment. And then finally, it's about testing it out. Just being your own best scientist of seeing what works for you and seeing what happens in truth, okay? So a continuation of what we're here for to really talk about the focus of this um, six week seminar is that we practice compassion not to make our suffering go away, but we practice because we are suffering. Uh, Chris Germer, one of my favorite teachers, says mindfulness is a special relationship with suffering. And so you can kind of see how compassion is really implicit underneath of that, that I can be in a particular mind state in the moment and really caught up in my experience. Um, and then that ends up showing up in the way I'm relating to experiences. So I might be in an experience where things aren't going the way that I would like them to. And we'll talk a little bit more about the definition of suffering next um, session. But we have this struggle with things happening the way that they are. And so we can be very anxious or very fearful, or we can be very disinterested and shut down. 
right? And all of that feels a very particular way in the body. If we can bring our awareness into it to recognize, oh, wow, I'm suffering in this moment. I'm really having a hard time. What might be helpful to me in this moment? Then we can really bring that intention and values from your basic core values or what's meaningful to you, your spirituality or your religion, religious figures or ideas or texts that are important to you. You can bring that into your practice and then we can notice what that feels like in the moment. So what might show up when we practice? So obviously you can tell we're talking about compassion and part of compassion is dealing with suffering. And so um, sometimes that might cause what we call um, backdraft. So these strong emotions sometimes show up and it's happened to me before where I might get tearful. Um, you may even see that happen with me sometimes during sessions. Um, and I've had that happen with people when I've been speaking publicly. So pleasant emotions, sometimes laughter and a sense of euphoria, relaxation, those are great. And most of the time people don't have a hard time with that. Neutral, sometimes we're not feeling anything at all. Generally when, we're, when people are in that state, they feel that they're somehow not practicing the correct way or maybe they're still a little skeptical. Um, and that's okay to be in that space. And so you can, again, it's a part of it is just letting go of that expectation that it's okay for you to be with the information with me and with your practice and experience in whatever way is showing up for how you're relating to it in the moment, right? The main thing is um, I do get a little bit concerned and that's why we, we have that disclosure um, at the beginning of the session is that sometimes unpleasant experiences might show up and we might feel a little more uncomfortable than what we're comfortable with. And so it's really important to disengage from practice when that happens. Usually what's going on is that's called backdraft. And one of the things that happens with that is that we're so used to closing off, shutting down, fighting, or running away from our unpleasant experiences, suffering, discomfort, pain, that then we get really um, a big emotion response sometimes when we open up to the experience that we're having. And so it's all right to just disengage when that happens. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that happens um, when people practice is we might be really um, closed in, really kind of defensive or sleepy. We kind of are noticing that maybe boredom is showing up. We might be distracted by anything and everything that shows up in the moment, or we might feel a sense of overwhelm. So there's nothing wrong with any of that. That's all within the realm of experiences that my patients have, that my students have, as well as um, anyone that I've spoken to at a seminar. And we all have different kinds of experiences that sometimes we feel closed off and we need to honor that that is something that we need in the moment. So I don't want you to feel like you have to be a particular way. Um, other times we're very ready for information and experiences in a particular way that someone teaches like me. I may or may not be for everyone. Um, so sometimes people though do feel really open and they have this sense of like, yes, this is exactly what I needed. Um, this is really important to me and fits within um, how I view the world. And so we can be really attentive, leaning in and sharing. So wherever you fall within that spectrum is okay. And part of it too is that sometimes our natural introversion or extroversion kind of um, sets us up for how we relate in the world with maybe more caution or not as being as open. And again, I don't like pathologizing any of that. So it's okay for you to show up the way that you are. And it's okay to just watch the seminar or to participate in the practices. But you'll often hear me say, I want us to stay in that low level when we're dealing with maybe a thought or an experience where we think about something that has been difficult is starting with low level stuff and disengaging when we feel uncomfortable, okay? So if, if we do get overwhelmed in any way and we wanna stick with it or ways that you can take good care of yourself is just asking internally, what does my body or my, or my emotions need in this moment? So often we can think, oh, I need a warm blanket or I need a cup of tea or I need to um, place my hand over my heart, which is part of what we're gonna be talking about today and practicing. Um, or sometimes we need to do that disengagement that we talked about, but some practical mindfulness-based practices that you can do 
is um, just following the breath for a moment. So let's just take three deep cleansing breaths. So I'll um, hit the, the meditation bowl here and just begin by taking an in breath and through the notes and then nice and slow an out breath. In through the nose or at your own pace and then nice and slow out through the mouth. And again, in through the nose and nice and slow out through the mouth. And then just taking a moment to check in and see how am I feeling? Okay, so these are just short informal practices that I teach to all my clients and students. And, um, and so this is just a short way to kind of bring your focus away from what's going on here in the body, um, which we'll get to at subsequent um, sessions. But um, just getting into following the breath kind of pulls us away from those emotion centers that are here in the body. The other thing is grounding your awareness in, in the extremities. So you can notice like tapping the hands. So just take a moment to just feel your hands. And I know some people who might be watching might be paraplegic, quadriplegic, or have numbness from various um, neurological conditions. Um, I know with a lot of my clients and patients with um, MS, get numbness or experiences like that. So um, it's okay to just kind of work with what might work with you to, so don't feel like there's only one way and you need to try every single one of them. But just in this moment, just noticing the fingers, just kind of touching connecting in the hands. And then as well, just placing your awareness into the feet, maybe wiggling the toes, just noticing what things feel like in the feet from the toes to the soles of the feet, and then back toward the heels. All right, and then I'm gonna ring the bowl again, just a few times softly and just listening to ambient sounds in the room wherever you are. So again, just noticing in the body, how do I feel right now? Were any of those helpful in creating a little bit of a shift in the body? Right, and then the other is just, thank you for taking good care of yourself. So if you need to leave or disengage from a practice, I want you to pay attention to that, okay? that right and responsibility. And I truly say that in love and kindness. I really want people to take good care of themselves. If we're forcing ourselves to do something and enduring something that we're not really ready to move into, um, what that does is that just defeats the purpose. We're trying to practice compassion towards ourselves and towards others. And so if we ignore that sense of taking good care of ourselves, and we're really not practicing compassion. So I want you to always pay attention to that experience. So like we talked about last um, session, we spend our time um, in this experience in mindfulness of what we call mind wandering. So the first rule of mindfulness is that the mind wanders. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just what it does. Um, research of Killingsworth and Gilbert found that we spend about 46.9% of our time in this default mode network where we're not really paying attention to what's happening in the moment and we're not very happy when we're in that state. So three things happen um, within this experience and that's called um, it, our mind creates a sense of self. We project this self into the future and the past and then the third thing is that we look at problems. We get hyper-focused on problems. The researchers call it a negativity bias. And rightly, a neuroscience researcher was the first person to find these parts of the brain that light up when we're in this state of mind wandering. We often do it when we're engaged in activities, talking with someone, just living our day. And that's where that 46.9% shows up. Okay. 
So we get into, um, when we're in that mind wandering state, we're not very happy. And so we don't feel very good. So part of what helps to pull us out of that experience is mindfulness. So mindfulness is defined as, um, again, in that um, Pali language of the Buddhist psychology, the original word was bhavana, which means cultivation. So we're cultivating awareness, paying attention to what's happening while it's happening with the intention, right, that relationship behind our awareness of the intention of acceptance and non-judgment. And that's the basic practice of mindfulness. We can also add within that, that sense of awareness of awareness, right, that humans have that capacity to know what they're thinking while they're thinking it and to know that they're thinking, right? So that awareness of awareness, we can use that with our intention to not just pay attention with acceptance and non-judgment, but in compassion, we move it a little bit further by saying my values or my spirituality or my religion teaches me to pay attention to experiences in life, myself or other people in a particular way, perhaps from a sense of warmth or love or peace or compassion or being fiercely protective um, and so mindfulness encompasses that whole practice of not just paying attention, but the relationship to the things that we pay attention to. Like for instance, paying attention to anxiety or when we're fearful or when we feel sad. And that again, that can help us to support us to become disentangled from those emotion states. So the benefits of mindfulness, I'm not going to read all of these, but what we do is um, there are some improvements that can show up around mindfulness, and that has to do with oxygen delivery, mood, sleep, and again, that epigenetic or immune response. So improvements in those areas, reductions in stress, impulsivity, trauma, impact from um, experiences of assault or for those people that are veterans who have been in war, lots of work in mindfulness with those populations that find really good evidence base in helping people um, learn what's called post-traumatic growth. And then of course, activation of pain centers um, of the brain, that tends to be reduced as well. So like with clients, uh, patients that I work with who have chronic pain, we teach them how to pay attention to their pain in a very particular way that's important to them. The other thing is this regulation of all kinds of neuro and biological chem chemicals in our system around our stress hormones, cortisol, um, and then all kinds of melatonin, oxytocin, um, things going on, which we'll talk about more a little bit around touch and what that does for us. And then um, they speculate that acetylcholine and serotonin are involved in meditation processes as well. Okay, so then we're defining what is compassion. So compassion has three components to it always, and this includes self-compassion. It's just the directedness of where we're paying attention, right? Compassion in general is awareness of other people's experiences. Self-compassion is awareness of our own experiences. And the, the thing that I always tell people around this, what shows up in the research is that we can never give someone else something that we don't have, right? So I wanna say that again, let that sink in. We can never give anyone else something that we don't have ourselves. So the person I have the longest relationship with is me. Right. And so if I don't treat myself very well, if I'm hard on myself and really rough, and most people tend to be kinder to others than they are to themselves, it's not to mean that you can't be compassionate towards others, but it's really hard to be really fully invested in being um, a really kind and loving human being towards others if we don't have that first practice of how we relate to ourselves. So the three components are mindfulness common humanity and kindness. So mindfulness is an empathy. So empathy and compassion are not the same thing. Empathy just gets us in the door. Empathy is cognitively or emotionally resonating with another human being or with ourselves in recognizing that we're suffering. So we use that sense of our heart and mind that we're paying attention, that we're impacted in our body. Um, 
and in our mind with how we relate to other people and with ourselves and feeling what we're feeling. Um, in the research, kind of how a really kind of vivid way is if you've ever watched anyone fall off of a bike or fall onto a bar um, in a video, you notice that there's this jolting sensation of pain through your whole body. That's empathy in action. That's how it works. So we literally feel in our bodies what we see happening with others. And then of course, with ourselves, we're just feeling what's going on. So that's mindfulness, just being aware of it. The second is common humanity, recognizing the greater universality of suffering. Just like that experience of noticing how we can know what it feels like to fall down and hurt ourselves. And when we see other people do it, we feel it in our own body. As well with ourselves, we can be in a state of feeling like we're alone in life. And so we might feel disconnected from the world. But if we can recognize that other people out there experience pain and suffering, that that's a part of life, that then that helps us to feel a little less alone. And then the third component is kindness. So that's just responding right, that sense of intention that we talked about earlier, the relationship aspect of really responding with warmth, love, kindness, care, and peace, right? So that's our relationship. So what happens particular around self-compassion, and a lot of the research around compassion is the same as well, and that's that there are these emotional supports that happen of having more um, happiness, less emotional avoidance, perspective taking, persistence, increase in emotion and body awareness, um, and then relational, all of these improvements in um, pro-social engagement with others, and then biological shifts and changes, as well as behavioral things that happen in, in, um, in self-compassion practice. Um, the other thing too is that um, just a few years ago, research um, came out through UC, uh, through Stanford University of um, gray matter density changes in the brain <clears throat> that allow us to become more compassionate. So literal shifts and changes in what we call neural sculpting changes that happen in the brain when people practice um, compassion and self-compassion. All right, so we're gonna talk about touch today and then we're gonna get into some practices um, so the, the basic overview here is that um, touch and hugs are super important um, to our physical and emotional health. And right now in the time that we're in, um, it can be a really challenging time to get the touch and hugs that you need. And so that's why we're going to talk about practice that might be supportive to you. So the main thing is um, the primary... Um, neurotransmitter around this is what we call oxytocin, a love or compassion hormone. So I'm not even going to talk about opioids and dopamine, which have to do with kind of um, restful states as well as opioids, which are natural painkillers. And that shows up with touch and hugs, as well as you notice in compassion, as well as in just the basic research of mindfulness, that there are these shifts and changes in opioid um, natural releases in the body as well as dopamine. Um, the oxytocin is the main kind of actor within the body. So oxytocin um, helps us with bonding. So it's very pro-social. It decreases fear. So that means it feels a certain way in our body that helps us to soothe ourselves, right? And so these actions, right, the relationship to suffering, that's why this is so important. It also increases our sense of generosity. All of the practices of compassion are based on generosity towards ourselves and towards others. So just to go over a few of these things, so oxytocin supports our bodies in cardiovascular protection. So that means reduction in inflammation, reduction in risk of um, having high blood pressure and plaque buildup, and that reduces the chances that we'll end up having some sort of a cardiac event. It also um, reduces depression symptoms. Um, quite a bit of research even beyond these references that are on the slide, and also reductions in anxiety symptoms. Okay. Um, the other thing is um, you're noticing, especially under anxiety, there's that little bullet point right under there. So it reduces the production of cortisol. So that's the stress hormones. That's also what's contributing to the shortening of those telomeres at the ends of our chromosomes. It's also what is causing degradation within our cells at the cellular level, which also involves that telomere um, outcome of mindfulness. 
So that's part of what is working around that with touch as well. It's also sleep quality improvement. So by decreasing levels of cortisol, we're also getting better sleep. We're also boosting the immune system. So that makes it uh, much better for our body to fight off infections like viruses and bacterial infections when they do come along. And it's also lowering our pain sensitivity. If you've noticed that shows up a lot, feels very different when we get touch versus if we don't and we just feel disconnected in the world. All right, so let's do a practice. This is an informal practice that I teach a lot and it is one of the core practices informally within mindful self-compassion, which is taught through University of California, San Diego, developed by Chris Germer and Kristen Neff. So what you're gonna start out is just allow your eyes to soften or close. And just noticing what does my body need right now? So allowing your body to be as comfortable as possible and allowing yourself to move through the practice here as you feel comfortable. It's okay to stay in a particular hand connection with the body that you feel comfortable with. If you don't feel like going on to another one or if one feels uncomfortable, go back to one that feels more comfortable to you. So just starting out, just allow your hands to rest on the legs. Just, this can be kind of like home base of just letting the hands rest right there on the legs. And just noticing how that this feels, the intention of touching the legs here. Just noticing what it feels like at the point of connection as well through the rest of the body. Now bringing one hand up to your cheek. Just noticing what this feels like. Remember, if anything feels uncomfortable, you can always go to the breath or just noticing ambient sounds. And always disengage or go back to a home base that feels good if anything feels uncomfortable. And now cradling your face in both hands. Just taking your time. And now bringing both hands down to your forearms. You can also just do one if that's more comfortable and just gently stroking, massaging the forearms. Or even up to the upper arm if you wish. Just noticing what feels good. Follow in the breath if you need to. That can actually be helpful anyway. And now crossing your arms in front of the body, perhaps one under and one over, and just giving yourself a gentle squeeze, just like giving yourself a hug. You can join me in kind of gently rocking side to side or or front to back. Sometimes that kind of gentle rocking can be really comfortable as well. Just noticing what this feels like at the warmth connection in the body, as well as through the rest of the body. Okay. And then just bringing the right hand up and over the heart or chest. And just moving the hand back and forth or in little circles. And you can be very surface. If that's more comfortable, you can press a little bit harder 
so that the skin moves underneath your head. Just whatever's comfortable for you. And now cupping your hand just a little bit like a gentle fist and then placing the other hand over the top of that. Just noticing at the point of connection and through the rest of the body. Now allowing the hand to flatten out and bringing the top hand down and over the belly. Kind of this sense of just stabilizing the body. Allowing the body to breathe. Just noticing the warmth of the hands connecting with the body point of connection and what you notice about how you feel through the rest of the body. Now bringing the other hand down, so both hands resting over the belly. And then just allowing the hands to rest one hand in the other, just like this, just resting down in your lap. Just a gentle squeeze, nothing too tight. And then just cupping both hands in the lap, just like this. Doesn't matter which one is over the top of the other one. Okay. All right. So now just reflecting within yourself. So the questions that I most often notice um, or bring up with clients and students is, what did you notice during the practice? So just notice what comes to mind. And for those who like to journal or write down notes, um, each session, um, you can bring a notebook that can actually be really helpful and just kind of writing down a few things just during the practice or after the practice and just writing down, what did I notice during this practice? What stood out to me? If people are having a more difficult time, then we go back to that sense of direct experience. Um, what did you notice about how you felt during the practice? Remember the three kinds of experiences that we have as human beings is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. All right, so that neutrality could be, I really didn't feel anything at all, or, or it was hard for me, like I had a client one time who was used to getting grabbed by caregivers when she was younger, and so that was a source of like, she's like, I couldn't stay there very long, so I went back to the heart or back to the legs. Or sometimes we have this sense of warmth, the feeling a little more relaxed, but we're just being with our body in a very intentional way. So what are you noticing in the body or in your emotions? Just naming that for yourself, even in this moment. Oh, I'm feeling more relaxed or I'm feeling sad or I'm still feeling anxious. Just even being gentle, you'll notice in my voice, just being a little bit more gentle in your voice. And then just noticing overall, has anything shifted or changed for me?
All right. So now we're going to go into another core practice in mindful self-compassion. And um, I'll, I'll give you websites of where you can find these practices in particular. Um, so this practice is giving and receiving compassion. It's about um, giving ourselves what we need internally as we breathe, as well as then shifting our attention, right? So again, we can't give anything we don't have. So we fill ourselves full of what we need. And then we allow that fullness to be the space from which we give to others, right? So we're never kind of depleting ourselves. There's kind of this um, popular language around compassion fatigue, right? So what compassion fatigue actually is, it's not really compassion fatigue. It just means that we're empathizing just constantly with other people without a lot that we can do about it. And it's just output constantly. So that's going to wear us down. So giving ourselves what we need and compassion is actually what we need. So compassion fatigue can make us avoid compassion, but what we really need is to be giving ourselves more compassion. And remember we talked a little bit last week around, we have these judgments against compassion, which again, we'll get to at later sessions of why that is. So we're just going to start this practice, just finding in your body a very comfortable position that feels supportive in your body. So that may be seated, that may be laying down, um, it may be standing up. I've had clients who have needed to stand up because of pain or whatever might be going on. And remember, there's no requirement that you absolutely have to sit still. It's like if you can. Um, and it's no requirement to make your mind be still, but see if you can come back to the practice again, again, over and over again, all right? So just coming into that sense of awareness of the body, hands resting on the legs, or if you wish, using the soothing touch practice that we just talked about of placing your hands over a part of the body that maybe needs attention right now. Okay, some people might do this if they're making this more of like a prayer within your own religious or spiritual tradition. And allowing the eyes to softly focus down if you want the eyes to be open or you can allow them to fully close allowing the jaw to become soft allowing the eyes to become soft in the sockets allowing the shoulders to be a little bit down and back if you can so not forcing anything just gently moving if you need to and setting your intention for the practice. So this is again, a focus on compassion. So allowing a hand to rest over the body to bring not just awareness to your experience, but to bring a sense of compassion, that mindful, common humanity, kind awareness. Bringing that intention to the body, to the breath, to the words that we'll be focusing on. And then begin by coming into three deep cleansing breaths, just at your own pace. Noticing the nourishment of the in-breath, soothing of the out-breath, just at your own pace. And at the end of the third breath, just allowing the breath to move into its own natural rhythm. There's no need to control the breath or make it do something in particular. Just allow it to rise and fall just like it would when you're not paying attention to it. And as you continue breathing out and back in, begin focusing primarily on the in-breath, just noticing how good it feels to breathe in. And 
And as you're breathing in, begin breathing in something good for yourself. Compassion, love, warmth, peace, courage, just whatever you feel that you need in this moment. You can use a word, just repeating compassion or love or peace on each in-breath. Or if you're more um, connected with imagery in the mind, you can imagine like breathing in a warm light or perhaps the presence of a loving being or a spiritual figure or religious figure or some loved one from your present or past who naturally brings that sense of happiness and connection to you. A warm light, a color, just filling yourself full of this thing that you need on each in-breath. Perhaps in your mind's eye, noticing this thing filling every cell of the body. And now shifting your awareness into the out breath, still breathing in and out, but just primarily focusing on the out breath. Noticing the ease of breathing out. How easy and how good it feels to just let go of the breath. It doesn't take any effort. And as you breathe out, begin sending compassion or something good to a loved one or someone who may be suffering in some way. It may be a family or friend, loved one. It may be a group of people that you know are suffering in the world right now. But just breathing out that ease of letting go, that sense of compassion, kindness, peace, whatever it is that you want to focus on. And just like we did with the in-breath, focusing on repeating the word on each out-breath, a felt sense of the word, that being that is connected with this thing that you feel this loved one needs, spiritual figure, or again, a warm light. Sometimes even you can imagine a sense of a warm light emanating from your heart into the world or like a, a beam of light toward this being or beings. See if you can focus on one being for now. And just that gentleness. Again, or those that are more visual, again, that sense of color sending whatever you're sending out into the world. And now begin shifting the breath into breathing in and out equally, focusing on both the in and the out breath. Breathing in compassion for yourself. Breathing out compassion for the other. If you need more language to support you, you can repeat the word. Like if I'm breathing compassion in for myself or peace out for another, it just be compassion, peace. love, happiness, just whatever it is that you're focusing upon. 
Sometimes you can use the words, one for me, one for you, or compassion in, compassion out. And if you wish, you can focus on more than one being, just allowing each being to come to mind one at a time. Perhaps noticing that heart connection to each being that shows up. And from your practice of giving yourself compassion, also beginning to offer that to whoever needs it. It's also okay to focus a little more on yourself. So maybe you may breathe in that compassion or what you need three breaths in, and then you give out one to another being. Or maybe you're more comfortable giving more out because you feel like you have more to give. Perhaps two out, and then giving yourself one breath of compassion. In. Just continuing to breathe in and back out. It's like you have access to this vast, infinite ocean of compassion. Gently rising, gently falling. Perhaps giving yourself over to this ocean of compassion. Again, allowing the imagery to fit your spirituality or your religious practice. You can make this like a prayer if you wish. If that's a part of your tradition. Or if you're a non-spiritual person, just whatever values are important to you. That ocean of compassion, of kindness, of courage. that way of alleviating suffering in the world. And just recognizing that this ocean of compassion is always available to you. It's always there within you. Through your values, through your religion, through your spirituality, it's always there to access whenever you need it. Now expanding awareness into the whole body breathing. Just noticing how the body feels in this moment. Allowing yourself to feel the way that you're feeling, to be just as you are, with no need to make it any different. And feeling the support of the cushions beneath you, the chair, perhaps your feet if they're resting on the ground. And slowly, Gently as you're ready, allowing your awareness to come back into the room. So now, again, just like we did after the soothing touch practice, just a, a moment of reflection. During this practice, what did you notice? What 
was the mind doing? What did you focus upon? What was important to you? Who are the beings that came to mind? What was it like to give yourself compassion? What was it like to then breathe out compassion for others? How did the practice feel in the body during those two stages of giving yourself what you need and towards others? What were the sensations that you noticed? Were there any other things that were important to you or beings or people in your life um, that you used in the practice to support yourself and in what you were sending out to others? And then just noticing if anything has shifted or changed. Are things the same as they were before the seminar started or before the practice started? Just noticing. So places to go to practice, um, just noticing that um, Kristen Neff, the primary researcher that I follow and was one of my initial teachers in mindful self-compassion, has her website www.self-compassion.org. And um, she has free videos. She has a full listing of all of her research and the research available on um, self-compassion. Um, and lots of free downloadable guided meditations that you can access. So again, we're not trying to sell anything. Um, we just want people to learn these practices so they, they can be helpful to you. Chris Germer is one of my um, teachers during teacher training. Um, his website is www.chrisgermer, all one word, com. And just like Kristen's website, he has a number of free guided um, downloadable meditations. And both of them have some PDFs that you can download for free as well about the practices or worksheet kind of things that you can do independently. Um, all of the practices are at the University of California San Diego Center for Mindfulness and Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. So guided meditations, center for msc.org, and then um, the meditations. There's a tab where you can do that backslash meditations. And then my website is www.emfm.space. And I have a couple of um, basic practices on the website, including one that I developed around how we relate to others in compassion that we won't be doing during this seminar series. But um, you always have access to it there as well as a basic, um, what we call compassionate breathing practice. All right. So a very deeply grateful um, thank you for joining us. Um, again, all of the practices and seminars are archived at the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation website. That's nwpf.org. And they're always free. And all of the previous courses of Mindful Compassion Hour are archived um, there on their website. So again, that deep um, gratitude for joining us for a mindful compassion hour. Uh, may you be free from inner and outer harm. May you be happy, peaceful, and free. May you be kind, loving, and forgiving toward your imperfections as well as the imperfections of others. May you be as healthy as possible. May you live with ease. And may you be from suffering and experience joy wherever it may be found. Thank you.